So this is the Alpha Yoke from Honeycomb Aeronautical, a much anticipated product which has just landed in Europe literally this week. I've had this one, what, two days and uh, we've taken it out of the box. We're going to have a look at it in a moderate amount of detail. Now the fact I've only had this two days, in fact it's only been up and running one day, <laughs> tells us that this is only going to be a first impressions video. Now it is important to acknowledge that this is first impressions because any of my criticisms and compliments indeed can't say anything about the long term implications for, for how the, the yoke performs over time. But hopefully it's still worth paying attention to. Now the style of this yoke isn't something that everyone's going to be wild about. I'm not particularly fond of the, the look of this. It's clearly it's been designed as a compromise between functionality on the one hand and you know I suppose visual appeal to, to appeal to this kind of, you know without being pompous or patronizing about it to the lower end you know the gaming market so it looks pretty flashy although you know this perhaps wouldn't look too out of place in the cockpit of a Cirrus Vision jet or a what's that little um, icon A5 float plane the yoke handle itself is is very well done. It's it's got the whole thing is very heavy. I haven't actually weighed the thing, but it's very substantial and heavy. And the handle itself is is weighty and heavy. I don't know what the construction is, whether that's metal or it's probably some sort of solid molded plastic by and large. Now the box itself is well it's hidden from view here because I've installed it in my cockpit. I have removed the front instrument panel so you can see at least the front fascia of the yoke. But it's quite a compact body. Uh, it's it's basically uh, not dome shaped, kind of cylindrical by and large. There is this removable piece. The front the front cross section looks almost rectangular, and there's a flat flat part on top, which is designed specifically to mount. If you have SciTech um, radio panel or the autopilot panel or um, the switch panel although the switch panel is in some sense duplicated by the switch gear on this that will mount to the top obviously it wouldn't fit here so that's a feature if you want that that um, flat part can actually be removed and you get a slightly uh, lower profile and a different look to it so you can do that the front face has got some switches on I'll come back to those switches in a, in a moment including a mag switch in fact over there You've got this kind of honeycomb, I suppose, signature mesh on the front, which looks a little bit gaudy. And it has got, you can see, this uh, LED lights behind that. That has, I suppose, some practical merit. You, there is a button on the back where you can, it's out of reach there, I won't bother tinkering with it. But you can cycle through about five or six different brightnesses, for the, including off, by the way, for the LEDs. Now it's of some merit because if you fly in the dark or in reduced lighting you, you do get some ambient kind of cockpit lighting from that so so that's okay I can't knock that. Now I should say something about how to go about reviewing something like this not everybody's going to have the same you know criteria about what's important in a yoke like this to me this yoke stands or falls on one thing you know it has one basic task to do which is to be a two axis analog joystick for controlling your ailerons and elevators. If you can't do that competently, and by which I mean smoothly, precisely and ergonomically, with an with a acceptable range of travel, then nothing else about this yoke really matters because you know it's, it's useless. And so that's what I'll be looking for in this yoke primarily. And of course I have a hardware cockpit which has got 200 odd switches in I don't really need switches and buttons and you know hat switches and and so on now all of that's nice to have but it's extra over and above the basic function of the yoke which which is to control the pitch and the roll axes right just some more about the style of this yoke before we move on the yoke handle is very appealing it looks great it feels pretty good it's covered in this kind of matte rubberized finish as is the whole body of the yoke. In fact this stuff's all over this yoke. 
This is what's called a thermoplastic elastomer coating and it's well known technology for giving a rubberized soft touch feel. In fact it's everywhere, you know, it's in the trim panels of your car, it's on your Logitech mouse, it's on your WH Smith rollerball pens, what else? It's it's everywhere and the problem is it doesn't last forever and in some cases it doesn't last very long at all and when it breaks down which it can do under the influence of humidity light um, maybe heat I think some sometimes in some cases I mean there are different formulations of this stuff the you know the oils and sweat from your hands when it breaks down it becomes sticky and gooey but there you go I've, I've mentioned it uh, you know we've got to think for some greater minds than mine behind the design of this in the meantime it's great, looks good, feels good. Uh, switch gear, we've got plenty of switches on here. The switches aren't, well, yeah, I mean I was going to say they're cheap switches. They're not cheap switches, they're, they're fine, they're perfectly adequate. The ergonomics, you know, I don't know how this compares to a, a real yoke in something with many buttons on like this. The, that thumb button is kind of in the shadow of these trim switches, um, as is that one. Well, slightly less so because the switches are oriented differently. We've got a button on the back side of this handle. We've got a big push to talk or something on the front, the top side of this one. We've got the oh, I'll, I haven't got my hat switch set up here. I'm using EZCA, but the hat switch works as you'd expect. Switches on the front of this yoke. We've got plenty of switches. Now they've got legends on. I'm not a big fan of that. These are marked up as master alternator, battery, avionic switches and lights under, the, under there. And they're all kind of toggle switches. The, the problem is, well, as I see it, there's really no purpose in having your lights on switches anyway, with the possible exception of your landing and taxi lights, which do actually affect the outside world. I mean, your mileage may vary if you're interested in looking at the aircraft from the outside and so on. So that's one thing. It, you know, if you'd left off the... I mean, of course you can program these switches to be whatever you want, so, so that's not really a problem. But but it means the legends may not be uh, correct <laughs> for the buttons you... for the functions you program on them. The other thing which is going to be a problem pretty much for many of the people out there, for some reason, these buttons are implemented... these toggle switches are implemented as pairs of buttons. So that top left one for example is button 1 and button 2. Now you would expect it to be button 1 and it can either be off or on and that's perfectly adequate for distinguishing two states and or even programming two different functions but that toggle switch actually toggles between button 1 on and button 2 off in one position then button 1 off and button 2 on in the other position. Now that's redundant now why am I telling you this? Well, there's no obvious problem with that until you try to program your buttons and switches and you get to the mag switch over here. And what you're going to notice is that the mag switch has got five, uh, five positions, off, right, left, both mags and then a start position. The start position isn't uh, spring loaded by the way as it would be in a real mag switch but you know we're not this I mean I should have said this from the outset as well whatever I say that can be interpreted as a critical comment about this yoke needs to be considered in the context of this being a cheap yoke this is a this is a cheap piece of equipment and um, you know you have to bear that in mind if I say something critical so, you know, at the end of the day, this costs £250. Full price, I paid less than that. I paid €220, Euros, which was, uh, well, it's slightly north of £200. And, you know, so far, I don't see any com anything to complain about, really. Um, you know, £200 doesn't buy you much of anything these days. So just, just keep that in mind. Now, what you're going to find is, when you go to program your mag switch, the off and the right position will be programmable as normal but the last three positions don't show up you, you can't detect them or, or may not show up for you and the reason for that is if you count up the functions bearing in mind that these toggles are two buttons each we've got 35 switches and 
it stops at 32. And the reason it does that is, well, again, this depends on your programming environment. If you set this up in, well, let's see, the Windows 7 control panel game controller settings dialog, will only show you 32 buttons. If you go into FSX and try and set this up, you will not see the last three buttons. If you use FSUIPC in FSX or in prepared, you will only see the the first 32 buttons. Now the reason for that is all of those things are, I think this is right, I mean someone will correct me on this no doubt if it's wrong, they're all based on the old-fashioned direct input API for managing joysticks and human interface devices. Now that API dates back to DirectX version 8 I think which was circa 2001 or poss possibly 2002 so that was current when FSX was designed in 2006, or released in 2006. Uh, Windows 7, I don't know when that came out. FSU IPC is old technology, even the version 5 has been updated somewhat for the 64-bit versions of prepared, but the basic functionality is the same, and again I suspect that's based on DirectX, sorry, direct input. What that means is that um, those things won't be able to see the, the top three buttons on this yoke. Now it's not a deal breaker, maybe there was some logic to why that dueling up of button functions being done, but if I was designing this for Honeycomb, I mean I would have designed those as single switches and we would have been well within the 32 limit and it would have been compatible with, with everybody. If you go into X-Plane 11 and set this up natively or if you're going to prepare version 4 and set this up natively you will very likely see all 35 buttons and you won't have any problems. It's only the mag switch that you lose functionality with. Uh, everything else works you know with your old software. So again not not too much of a big deal. Okay so that's something about or possibly quite a lot about the basic form of the yoke, the switch gear and so on and some of the things about its aesthetic appearances. I'm not going to say anything about the clamping other than the clamping, this, I've got it clamped with the two front mounted G clamps which are made of solid steel, they're about 3-4 millimeter thick steel, very heavy they clamp the base plate to the desk. I haven't used the sticky pad but I haven't really needed to. The yoke does move about a little bit but that's not the base plate moving against the clamps, it's the, I mean the yoke mounts separately to the base plate and it's actually the yoke swiveling slightly on the base plate. That's, that's not a big deal, it's, it's, it's good enough and it stays put while you're flying. Now, coming back to the, the plot or the main course really with this, this yoke and that's the action of the yoke, we've got aileron and elevator control. Right off the bat we need to talk about the basics. We've got rather limited travel on this yoke. We've got, although the shaft protrudes quite a long way, it doesn't disappear all the way in when you push it forward. We've actually got three and a quarter inches total, just shy of eight and a half centimeters of pitch control. Now that's relatively sh short, but it's what it is and it is flyable as we'll see. We've got, I suppose conversely, in the aileron direction, we've got a full 90 degrees rotation in each direction, so 180 lock to lock. Now that's cited by many people and by the literature as realistic, and now of course it's realistic depending on what kind of plane you fly, or unrealistic. The Cessna light aircraft, for example, typically have 180 degree lock to lock. Uh, this cockpit I've built around a Twin Otter. The Twin Otter doesn't have 180 degrees, the yoke goes to 60 degrees in the Twin Otter. And indeed in the, well I'm not even sure about this, but I'm pretty sure in the other de Havilland aircraft, so the Beaver and the Otter, probably similar travel. So in one sense this is not realistic for those aircraft. Now there are some other unintended uh, consequences of going to a yoke with 180 degree travel and using a program such as FSX or Prepared 
that wasn't or that was designed specifically for yokes that didn't have 180 degree travel. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is FSX and prepared take your analog inputs and scale them in a non-linear way, scale them up indeed. So the travel in your physical yoke is scaled up before it's applied to the control surfaces or to the yoke or joystick in the virtual cockpit. And it does that because you know FSX and prepared they're basically designed to work with desktop joysticks from way back or indeed a, a range of different joysticks you know with di different capabilities but but pretty much none of them had this capability when FSX was designed and then prepared is based on FSX under the covers so maybe we'll take a little side trip into looking at that before we continue now one of the reasons that we're going to do that is because there's something else you need to know about this which is that both the pitch axis and the roll axis have a null zone apparently, I mean this is not advertised and in fact it's even contradicted by Honeycomb's own um, description of this product on the website it says there's no dead zones or null zones, can't remember which term it uses but actually that's, that's evidently not true if you look at this under a microscope if you like we've got a null zone in both the pitch axis and the roll axis which is unexpected, now it's yet to be determined to what extent that really matters um, in flying this yoke around but it's there. So here we are in FSX this is the Steam Edition we're just going to demonstrate some of those limitations the first thing to, to note is this non-linearity we're looking at the Cessna yoke Cessna 172 and the setup is done directly in FSX in the options settings controls dialog we've got enable controllers switched on and we've got the elevator and aileron assigned as you'd expect uh, so if you just see that moving the yoke through its full range of travel has the desired effect but the the mapping isn't one to one you can see that the virtual cockpit yoke kind of lags behind initially and then speeds up so it's a non-linear mapping and that's an unintended consequence really of this honeycomb yoke having a full 90 plus 90 degree travel because FSX is designed really to compensate for yokes that aren't able to do that you can't get rid of that in FSX the only thing you can do is to introduce a lag to the control response that's under the guise of sensitivity so if I put the sensitivity halfway you'll see that sensitivity isn't really the best name for this parameter at all what it actually does is it, it kind of damps the motion it doesn't affect the mapping it just introduces this strange lag now I've talked about this at great length in a previous video that was my Cytec ProFlight Cessna yoke review so that's all I'm going to say about that for now one thing I didn't make clear in that video incidentally was you can't get rid of that lag completely by using FSUIPC um, let's have a quick look at that if we go into add-ons FSUIPC axis assignment if we go to the aileron axis and put that to FSUIPC uh, instead of FSX assign that to aileron I'll just do it with the ailerons for now and I've already calibrated this so we have looking this point here there's no null zone set and we've got that calibrated nicely so it's well more or less zero in the center so we okay that uh, oh we're, hang on we're fighting FSX now we have to turn off the mapping in FSX if I just disable the controllers so we've now got this set up through FSU IPC and you see we're getting that same non-linear transformation the difference is we can tweak that by changing the slope we go to the aileron setup there's a button called slope we click that we go into the negative zone you see it flattens out in the center and actually we don't want that sorry that's the positive zone negative zone it steepens it in the center and flattens out towards the extremes 
So we should see a slight difference in that mapping. And that seems slightly different subject, um, subjectively, although it still seems to accelerate towards the extremes. Cut a long story short, if we go and put the maximum slope that we can introduce there, so minus 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that goes all the way up to minus 15, and try that. We still have a non-linear mapping there. And actually the control is much coarser out, so you can see it's granulated there, quantized if you like, which is very unsatisfactory. So we can sort of mitigate that with FSU IPC, not completely, but it's satisfactory. For the purposes of demonstration I'm going to turn that slope off completely. Uh, and indeed I'm going to go back to FSU IPC and un unhook those two axes, put them back to FSX. Um, uh, I left the elevator one there already. Back into FSX. Re-enable the controllers. So, all right. So the last thing I'm going to demonstrate here is the fact that we have dead zones built into this honeycomb yoke. Something that's not advertised and few people have already discovered and if I just let's go with the aileron because that's probably easier to see I'm actually wiggling the yoke around the center now which you should see on the camera view I'm trying to increase the oscillations there that's quite a significant wiggle we're not getting any response in the virtual cockpit and then if I go large enough in those oscillations we start to see a wiggle and again I'm doing it within now I'm not going to measure precisely that that range of wiggle but I hope you can see on there that it's very substantial um, you know it may be the order of five maybe even ten degrees and we have that on the elevator action as well you can see there's no movement in the virtual cockpit despite me moving that half a centimeter or more in fact that's a huge well not, perhaps not huge, but quite a significant dead zone there. The other way to demonstrate that is if I let's do it with the elevators first. If I try and move smoothly from all the way back through the center to all the way forward, I'll do that a few times just so I get the feel of it. I'm trying not to stop in the center. There is a not a detente, but a, there's a definite centering tendency where the, the, the two springs balance out. But nevertheless, I am moving, I am not stopping the yoke mechanically in the center. But you can see that there's a definite stop, there's a definite pause in that animation. And if we do that in the, it should be easier to do in the elevators as well. Sorry, the ailerons as well. I won't go from all the way left to all the way right, I'll just go through the, the centre. I'll just press the brake button by mistake there. <laughs> so we, we might start careering off down the runway if I'm not careful. Again I'm moving it without stopping through the centre and you can see that the on-screen animation is showing that the virtual cockpit yoke definitely stops in the middle there. So there's a flat, there's a dead spot on both axes and if I go back to look at that in FSU IPC just to confirm that if you like, that's ailerons, um, it's on zero at the moment, if you look at the input value here that's the important one and I'm moving it through the centre smoothly and you can see it pauses on zero. So that is not 
me pausing it I'm moving without stopping through the center and it is actually stopping. If you look at the box below that for the elevator I'll do the same thing smoothly through the center and it actually stops oops hang on I messed it up there you can see it's not stopping on the same value every time sometimes it's stopping on zero sometimes it's stopping on 129 or minus 129 and just one further demonstration of that we can go to Windows Control Panel Devices and Printers Alpha Flight Controls Game Controller Settings Properties so we can tweak the yoke here and have a look what's happening. If we go to Calibrate we can get some numbers. We click Display Raw Data um, now, this, although this is raw data, I'm sure this is not raw data coming directly from the A to D converter because this is a very coarse scale. This is 255, not 255, which is only a 8-bit. This is only an 8-bit value, but still it's given us some, some data. It's centered on 127 in each axis. If we go with the aileron axis, I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to just try and move it slowly but smoothly through the center without stopping it but you can see, I hope you can see, that it actually pauses on 127 you have to just take my word for it, I'm not doing that deliberately it's, it's more difficult to see unless I go uh, very slowly because of this the coarseness of this scale try the elevators, this is harder because it's it's a tougher spring But again, hopefully you can see it stops on 127. And if I just do that thing where it's in the centre, I'm going to wiggle the ailerons. This is a better test really because you can see I'm clearly wiggling that yoke side to side and the numbers are not changing. That's a big oscillation. That was a massive oscillation actually. But again, don't forget this is, uh, this is obviously a rounded value. I'm not sure why this is rounded in the calibration screen but the fact that this is only an 8-bit scale probably is exaggerating the extent of this dead zone. And if I do it in the elevator action same deal. So we shouldn't pay too much attention to the, the apparent size of that dead zone whether that's going to be significant in flying the aircraft, time will tell. We'll get to that very shortly. The pitch axis is pretty stiff. and In fact, if you measure that, you get a, about a 3 kilo load is required to pull it all the way back or push it all the way forward. And that's pretty... feels pretty linear, actually. There's not too much um, rising rate. I think that's called but it's but it's a good hefty feel to the pitch axis now by way of contrast the roll axis is very very weedy and indeed you know using the device that I use to measure the pitch forces it doesn't even register you know I couldn't even measure the the force so it's you know it's less than a half a kilo you know it's grams in terms of uh, you know, equivalent weight. You know, it almost feels like, and I'm sure this is just a perceptual thing, it almost feels like um, it gets easier to turn as you turn it away from centre. I'm sure that's just because you, you're kind of breaking out of that opposing... You know, there's a, there's a spot in the centre where the left and right spring forces, or bungee spring forces, are in, are in balance, and then you sort of have to break out of that balance and when you break out of it, you know, it kind of feels like it becomes easier to turn. That's probably an illusion. It's um, kind of smooth. I mean, it's very smooth. There's no, there's no stop-start. There's no sticking, really, detectable. Um, 
which which is really the most important thing. I don't know what what the bear you know it feels like the bearing. I don't know what the bearings are in this, but it feels like there's a sort of independent bearing for the, the roll because there's no with, with the pitch axis you get a sort of you can hear it and and there's sort of a I don't want to say vibration or there's a I suppose there is vibration of sorts you know as you push and pull this axis you can feel it through the handle that's not intrusive and it's not a problem but there's none of that effect when you go in the aileron direction so that seems to be two independent bearings so it feels good it feels smooth and it as the other thing is to say it feels you know in terms of independence there doesn't seem to be any cross play as you will find in some of these other cheap yokes so so the pitch is just as smooth if you've got some aileron applied or lots of aileron applied uh, and vice versa I suppose one thing about this very weak aileron spring is it you do tend to clunk against the stops if you're going all out um, actually there's a clunk in the, the pitch as well it'd be nice if that was somehow damped if there was a rubber <laughs> stopper or something on that but uh, you know, 250 pounds. Don't forget, this is a this is a cheap, cheap, cheap yoke, and so far it's uh, it's doing pretty good value for money. So that's pretty much all I can think to say about the yoke. Without getting in and flying it around, I'm not going to set up these buttons. You know, buttons are buttons, switches are switch. Uh, these things, you know, if they appear in the Windows game controller dialog, if they appear in FSX, they can be programmed. You know, that's there's nothing there's nothing else to say about that. So we're up. Not doing anything too methodical here. We're just going to give it a little bit of a workout. So I'm noticing already that this feels different to what I'm used to. I mean that discrepancy between the amount of back pressure we need and the amount of aileron pressure we need, that's quite significant or noticeable. You know, largely because it's different to what I'm accustomed to. Not necessarily that it's bad per se. So the aileron op operation is very smooth, there's no doubt about that, but a little bit light and not progressive. You know, the sense is that it's kind of linear side to side because we're not needing anything like the full aileron deflection. On the twin otter, of course, the yoke doesn't go to 90 degrees left or right, it goes to about 60 degrees, which if you look at the virtual cockpit, well, I perhaps shouldn't be putting on <laughs> full deflection while we're travelling at 110 knots. But a very smooth action, if if a little on the light side. The a, the elevator action is much tougher. You know, there is no detente, but there is a definite. I mean, it's an almost detente, where for about I suppose an inch and a half in the centre, you know, it's. I mean, it almost is in a detente that you have to, it doesn't click out of it. It's obviously the balance point of the two springs or bungees. But it's not intrusive in the sense of a, an actual mechanical notch. So we're good with that. And it does give us a very assertive centering. You know, it centers pretty much, if you look at the numbers, in FSU IPC or in the calibration screen, it centers pretty much exactly every time. Which may or may not be entirely realistic, but it's but it's kind of what you want really in the sim. So you don't have to chase constantly 
to trim. Aside from the weight of that elevator action, it's not as smooth. Now this is not necessarily a criticism, it's a, dif it's a difference, it's an observation. It's got much more of a kind of a, well, I hesitate to say scratchy feel, but that's kind of what I, what I want to say. You can feel, or scrape, scrapey feel. <laughs> But again, that's just, uh, it's just how it feels. It's just a kind of a slight tactile feedback. But the effect is, you know, the net effect is, it doesn't bind, it's an overall, you know, despite the sort of slightly rough feel to it, it doesn't bind, it's a progressive and very controllable operation. I think what we'll do is we'll uh, chop the power, we'll make a, a rapid descent and just try a landing at concrete municipal here. Probably have to do a 360 to do that. So we want to roll out on a heading of pretty much north, got us on the airport. That's one orbit, I think we'll do another one. Let's go steeper. So we're able to do those precise adjustments in pitch and in roll, which is just what we need. Now the question is whether that central kind of notch tendency is going to get in the way when we're doing that at low speed with large deflections near the touchdown. We want that speed to bleed off now. Let's dump the throttles. See if we can just hold it. Well that wasn't too bad. That notch is a little bit intrusive but again not as intrusive as if it was actually a mechanical, a proper mechanical notch. Alright so we're trying something different now, we're just heading towards Israel's farm, we're on autopilot, going to come off that right now and we're going to just put it down on the chicken field to the left of Israel's farm. Israel's farm is right in the centre of the screen now, just below the, to the left of that inset picture. And then to the left of that, you'll see some long buildings with a strip this side of them. So if we're going very fast here, we might do a bit of a 270 degree turn there to bring us round onto that on about a 2 4 heading. Kind of a short strip, let's go to all the flaps, start to put some of that power back in, otherwise we're going to end up being a bit short. So we're looking for smooth, progressive control during the flare in the elevators and we're going to be wanting to finesse that as we go. I've just stayed on idle here because I came in really rather too steep. So we're going to have a, an abrupt but well controlled flare, not too much. Hold it off, try and hold it off a little more. Oh, slight balloon. We're down, let's go reverse before we cross the road. <laughs> Alright, well, we did overcook it somewhat there. 
<laughs> Alright, so we switched aircraft. We're still on the chicken field next to Israel's farm. We should be set up with a major crosswind. We should get a good workout with the elevators and ailerons at the same time on the approach in the Real Air Scout. Okay, we need to slow down. We need to be in this crowd to the left on the initial approach. Whoa, probably too high here. Could have used some more flap, but we don't need it. Okay, I'm going to kick it around with the right rudder now, dip the left wing, land it on one wing, just holding it off there. Stall one just before we touch down, that's what we expect. Full right rudder, keeping it straight, and then I can try and step on the brakes at the same time. Okay, well that was on the strip. <laughs> that's a pretty good workout for ailerons and elevators at the same time. Do notice in that flare, really, we very quickly get to the backstop on this yoke. Don't forget we've got a relatively small amount of travel, but we had good control there. So that's the Alpha yoke from Honeycomb Aeronautical. First impressions only, of course. Time will tell if any of these comments stands up to the test of time, but on first impressions the yoke absolutely achieves its aim of being a affordable, built down to a price and yet high quality yoke. It's certainly capable in that basic sense of being a two axis joystick controller with smoothness and precision, adequate precision. We do seem to have null zones in the centre. There is some controversy about whether those are by design or whether there's some kind of fault in, certainly not just in my yoke but I've seen at least two other reports of those null zones. But also it's worth pointing out, or worth reiterating, that although they are present, they don't really seem to affect in any noticeable way the yoke in practice. So I wouldn't attribute too much significance to those slight null zones. Time will tell again. Uh, well, I mean, the number one criticism I've seen from other people about this yoke is the lightness of the roll axis centering and that's something I've pointed out. Time will tell whether that's something we can live with. Flying it around in these two aircraft it's certainly doable. It's just that sort of lack of balance between the pitch and roll really. The pitch action is absolutely appropriate I, I believe that force that gives you realistic feelings of elevator trim or the need to uh, trim the elevator carefully and also at um, manipula manipulating the aircraft through the flare so that's, that's, that's very good. Perfectly acceptable smoothness in both pitch and roll. No cross talk in terms of the mechanics. Uh, it would be nicer to have a longer pitch travel, no question. But again, it's, you know, it's, it's in keeping with the competitors that this thing is trying to displace. And displace them it will. You know, this, I've tried to avoid naming any of the competitors specifically. I don't think that's good form in a review. If first impressions stand up to scrutiny and this thing holds together and they can keep producing them at the price point that they've targeted, you know, this is going to wipe the floor with the competition. No doubt about that. It's worth mentioning that the Honeycomb do seem confident that this yoke will stand the test of time. It has a five year warranty. You know, people have criticised this yoke and complained and said they'll avoid it because it doesn't have contactless sensors, it uses potentiometers. Like almost all its stable mates, it has to be said. There's nothing wrong with using potentiometers in a yoke, it's been done for decades. These potentiometers, they're not going to be cheap rubbish, they'll last for, well, I mean, pots are graded in terms of numbers of cycles, and these are certainly industrial quality potentiometers, and they'll be good for hundreds of thousands. I did see some actual numbers somewhere, but hundreds of thousands of cycles. It's not a worry. And in terms of precision, all those arguments for contactless sensors really don't stand up in something this... You know, at the end of the day, this is a s somewhat precise instrument. 
but it, it's debatable really whether it's going to benefit from contactless sensors or even higher resolution A to D converters. I don't know what the resolution of the A to D uh, converters in this is. I suspect it's the regular 10 bit or it's possible they've used a 12 bit controller. And here's another thing worth bearing in mind. If you do wear out the potentiometers and you can't replace them or you don't want to replace them, you can just throw this thing in the skip and buy another one and you're still ahead of the game at this price point. Now I'm not suggesting that's an economical or a environmentally friendly thing to do, but you know it defeats the argument for contactless sensors as a reason for not buying something like this, certainly. So yeah, that's it, Honeycomb, Alpha Yo gets my vote in this price bracket, and it'd be very interesting to see when their Bravo throttle quadrant slash panel is released, what innovations that brings to the market. In the meantime, I'm going to keep flying this one around for a little while, and you know, in due course, maybe I'll do an update if there's anything more to say.